Liberating Life, Women's Revolution, by Abdullah Ohalan. Introduction by the International Initiative. The brochure before you is the third brochure of its kind prepared by the International Initiative. These brochures have been compiled from different books written by Abdullah Ohalan in order to give you a short outline of his opinions on specific topics. Before Ocalan's abduction and imprisonment in 1999, several books based upon his speeches on sex and gender were published, among them three volumes of Nasal Yasamayli. How to Live The title of a book of interviews with him, Orkeji Older Mech, Killing the Male, became a well-known saying among Kurds. Akalan coined several slogans like a country can't be free unless the women are free, thereby redefining national liberation as first and foremost the liberation of women. In his prison writings, the liberation of women is touched on numerous times as part of Akalan's discussions of history, contemporary society and political activism. This brochure has been compiled from excerpts on this topic from Akalan's work, especially his most recent, as yet untranslated, works. The practice he observed in real socialist countries and his own theoretical efforts and practice since the 1970s has led Akalan to the conclusion that the enslavement of women was the start of all other forms of enslavement. This, he concludes, is not due to woman being biologically different to man, but because she was the founder and leader of the Neolithic matriarchal system. Abdullah Akalan is not only a theorist, he is the leader of a movement that strives not only for the liberation of Kurdish people but also to find answers to the question of how to live meaningfully. This is why his writings have such impact on the lives of so many. He has been concerned with the issue of women's liberation all his life, and especially so during the struggle. He strongly encouraged women in the movement to take up the struggle against male dominance, providing inspiration through his critique of patriarchy. This approach and conduct from such an influential leader contributed to major developments. For many years he spoke not only of the importance of surpassing constructed roles for women and men, he also encouraged the establishment of women's movements and institutions so that women can question and reshape themselves, their lives men and society. Thus, hand in hand with the Kurdish liberation struggle there has arisen in Kurdistan an untypically strong participation of women in all areas of life. In fact, the outstanding dynamic and vitality of the women's movement in Kurdistan often surprise the observer who does not expect this in a region of the world that is regarded as rather patriarchal. Over the years, Abdullah Akalan often suggested that the level of woman's freedom determines the freedom level of her society. He stated this yet again during a recent meeting with a BDP, Peace and Democracy Party, delegation, to me, women's freedom is more precious than the freedom of the homeland. This is how the idea for a special brochure on the question of women's freedom came about. 1. Forward The question of women's freedom has intrigued me throughout my life. While at first I viewed the enslavement of women in the Middle East and in general as the result of feudal backwardness, after many years of revolutionary practice and research I came to the conclusion that the problem goes much deeper. The 5,000-year-old history of civilization is essentially the history of the enslavement of woman. Consequently woman's freedom will only be achieved by waging a struggle against the foundations of this ruling system. An analysis of mainstream civilization with regard to the freedom question will make clear that civilization has been weighted down by an ever-increasing slavery. This mainstream civilization is the civilization passed down from, and in return influenced by Sumer to Akkad, from Babylon to Assur, from Persia to Greece, Rome, Byzantium, Europe, and finally the USA. Throughout the long history of this civilization, slavery has been perpetuated on three levels, first, there is construction of ideological slavery, conspicuously, but understandably fearsome and dominant gods are constructed from mythologies, then there is use of force, lastly, there is seizure of the economy. This three-tiered enchainment of society is excellently illustrated by the ziggurats, the temples established by the Sumerian priest state. The upper levels of the ziggurats are propounded as the quarters of the god who controls the mind. The middle floors are the political and administrative headquarters of the priests. 
Finally the bottom floor houses the craftsmen and agricultural workers who are forced to work in all kinds of production. Essentially, this model has been unchanged till today. Thus, an analysis of the ziggurat is in fact an analysis of the continuous mainstream civilization system that will enable us to analyze the current capitalist world system in terms of its true basis. Continuous, accumulative development of capital and power is only one side of the medallion. The other side is horrendous slavery hunger, poverty and coercion into a herd-like society. Without depriving society of its freedom and ensuring that it can be managed like a herd, central civilization cannot sustain or preserve itself, because of the nature of the system according to which it functions. This is done by creating even more capital and instruments of power, causing an ever-increasing poverty and herd-like mentality. The reason why the issue of freedom is the key question in every age, lies in the nature of the system itself. The history of the loss of freedom is at the same time the history of how woman lost her position and vanished from history. It is the history of how the dominant male with all his gods and servants, rulers and subordinates, his economy science and arts, obtained power. Woman's downfall and loss is thus the downfall and loss of the whole of society with the resultant sexist society. The sexist male is so keen on constructing his social dominance over woman that he turns any contact with her into a show of dominance. The depth of woman's enslavement and the intentional masking of this fact is thus closely linked to the rise within a society of hierarchical and statist power. As women are habituated to slavery hierarchies, from the Greek word, e, a, a or hierarchia, rule by the high priest, are established, the path to the enslavement of the other sections of the society is paved. The enslavement of men comes after the enslavement of women. Gender enslavement is different in some ways to class and nation enslavement. Its legitimization is attained through refined and intense repression combined with lies that play on emotions. Woman's biological difference is used as justification for her enslavement. All the work she does is taken for granted and called unworthy woman's work. Her presence in the public sphere is claimed to be prohibited by religion, morally shameful, progressively, she is secluded from all important social activities. As the dominant power of the political, social, and economic activities are taken over by the men, the weakness of the women becomes even more institutionalized. Thus, the idea of a weak sex becomes a shared belief. In fact, Society treats woman not merely as a biologically separate sex but almost as a separate race, nation, or class, the most oppressed race, nation, or class, no race, class, or nation is subjected to such systematic slavery as housewifeization. The disappointment experienced due to failure of any struggle be it for freedom or equality or be it a democratic, moral, political, or class struggle bears the imprint of the archetypal struggle for power relationship, the one between woman and men. From this relationship stem all forms of relationship that foster inequality slavery despotism, fascism, and militarism. If we want to construe true meaning to terms such as equality, freedom, democracy, and socialism that we so often use we need to analyze and shatter the ancient web of relations that has been woven around women. There is no other way of attaining true equality, with due allowance for diversity, freedom, democracy, and morality. But unambiguously clarifying the status of women is only one aspect of this issue. Far more important is the question of liberation, in other words, the resolution to the problem exceeds the importance of revealing and analyzing it. The most promising point in the current chaos of the capitalist system is the, albeit limited, exposure of women's status. During the last quarter of the 20th century feminism managed, though not sufficiently, to disclose the truth about women. In times of chaos, the possibility of change for any phenomenon increases in keeping with the level of progress or clarification available, thus, in such times, small steps taken for freedom may amount to leaps forward. Women's freedom can emerge as the big winner from the current crisis. Whatever has been constructed by the human hand, can be demolished by the human hand. Women's enslavement is neither a law of nature nor is it destiny. What we need is the necessary theory, program, organization, and the mechanisms to implement them.